our next speaker is uh, Dietmar Kohl. I'm practicing my German a lot today. Okay. <laughs> uh, he is a long time member of the ISO C committee. I mean, uh, I've been in the committee only for 15 years. Yeah. He was already there. I don't know for how long, but probably another 15 years. No, uh, 10, about 25 ah. years now. So, many things that are wrong in the committee, they are <laughs> their fault, <laughs> not mine. It's my fault. <laughs> okay, so if you didn't have enough coroutines, we are going to have more coroutines. More coroutines in a long session, and he's seated there just because he wants to do leaf coding. So he's really brave. So thank you very much, Dietmar. The floor is yours. All right. Hello. All right. So last time I did it, I didn't get through what I wanted to do in 90 minutes. We have 60 over here, so I get through it. 59. <laughs> all right, 59, all right, fine. Um, okay, so coroutines. Why am I interested in coroutines? Um, I was actually against the coroutines as we have them for a while. I didn't understand them. I didn't have anything to play with. Uh, since I have started playing this, and uh, I find it's actually very interesting. Coroutines support ships with all major compilers. It's not perfectly correct everywhere, as far as I can tell, but there are small errors, uh, which you find when you compile with different things. It's hmm, a little bit inconsistent, but mostly it's uh, relatively straightforward. Now, the uh, compiler ships with coroutines, but the standard library doesn't have anything nice around the coroutines. The coroutine support in the language is very, very bare bones. Who has used coroutines? Anybody use coroutines? Okay, a few people. So this is not necessarily the talk for you, but uh, so it's very bare bones what we have. There are no coroutine classes which make it nice in C++ 20. We had hoped that C++ 23 would contain a generator and a task. We managed to get a generator sort of last minute. I think it's fine, it's all good, but it came actually relatively last. There's no task yet at all. So we have this nice feature in the language, which we all would like to use, but it's said to be hard, and I will show that it's not hard. I will implement a task, hopefully reasonably to completion in, uh, in the session. So um, why do I think it's important and, and uh, useful? The basic reason is there are lots of async uh, stuff around. Anything which is I.O. is typically async. You wait for something to be read. You may need to uh, wait until something gets rid. You may wait on a different thread. All of these things we do since ages, and we typically use something like callbacks or futures, and you always have lifetime issues, and code is a little dis disparate. And it's all in all not nice. The coroutines we have actually kind of make it reasonably nice because all the variables you have are local variables, and you can just wait on them, and it's actually quite, quite uh, pretty. There are lots of uh, other things you can uh, co-evade as well, for example, unavailable resources, like maybe you have uh, something which needs, needs a lot of memory, and you could basically write your code in a way to say, all right, I'll co -evade until we actually have enough memory, and then we do things, or you have enough file descriptors, or whatever it is. Uh, I've played a little bit, I'm not gonna show that. I had hoped to show something like that, but it's too much in the end, uh, reordering requests to a database. This could be useful to say, all right, you could actually batch things up and by basically reordering when you do things, and batching is often more effective uh, things. So lots of things which are uh, um, core teams, something which is not uh, as obvious and is very interesting, there's a uh, talk by Goran Nishanov, uh, who did the core teams, who co on memory. The idea is he does a, uh, the core does a mem advice, uh, or something like that. Um, knowing that I'm going to access this memory in the future, and uh, then it does other things, m maybe more core advisors, and eventually gets back, and it's just kind of for a few milliseconds. So stuff is actually uh, quite efficient as well. So lots of interesting opportunities. Um, before 
going into what core teams are, there are basically two real key aspects which are important, and I will give a little bit of details over there. There's something which is an evader, which is basically specifying how async work is executed. Uh, has just three operations, relative straightforward, and something like a promise type inside a coroutine type, which has a number of other operations, and you just need to fill them in, and then you get a coroutine. So, what is an evader? The basic idea of an evader is if you have an uh, expression like covate expression, possibly uh, giving a value, it gets translated into uh, a little bit of pseudocode. This is not really the true code you see, but it's a reasonably good mental model and sufficient for the talk over here. The idea is first, the expression is the covate operator is applied. And uh, this is. Um, if that does not exist, it's basically an uh, identity operation. And uh, what comes out is an evader. There's also an evade transform, which is injected, possibly. I don't show that over here. But the idea is the expression is turned into an evader, maybe, right? And maybe an evader already. The evader is then asked, are you ready? When, when it says, yes, I'm ready, uh, and this is exactly not right, it's exactly negated, I just see. Um, if, if it is actually not ready, it does something else. It suspends with uh, getting a coroutine handle. This is basically coming from a, can only be done from this inner coroutine, and you get a handle to that coroutine. And then you do whatever you do to set up possible resumption, and eventually it gets resumed in some shape or form and carries on. And if evade ready is true, like I said, it's exactly negated. I keep doing these things. Uh, the um, evade ready actually doesn't uh, skips over the suspension and immediately goes to evade resume. In both cases, independent on whether you suspend it and resumed, it always gets to evade resume. So it's basically three operations, checking, which is basically an optimization potentially to say we are ready, we don't suspend, uh, possibly suspending and evade resume. Uh, so this is the actually kicking off the work, kind of the more important thing. And then the other side is we have an, uh, okay, this is just a Vader type, let's skip over that. It's just re resetting then. The other thing is we have a coroutine thing. So if you have a coroutine function, a function which does one of the core operations, and there was earlier a question, why do we need core return? Uh, the answer is there are three operations, uh, three things which inside the function body indicate that this is not a normal function. This is a coroutine. There's co weight, there's co yield, and there's co return. If you have one of these guys inside your function, it's not of a real function. It does actually something different. It starts off by basically allocating kind of a stack frame. It allocates it or space for a stack frame. It allocates that possibly using operator new, but imagine it's just going to go on the heap. It's not on the stack, so it lives long enough. Once it has the, this frame, which contains an object of the promise type, and promise type is something we can control, we can put things in there. Otherwise, the uh, frame contains all things like uh, storage for local mem uh, variables which are needed, uh, storage for the um, ar arguments. This function over here has no arguments, but you could imagine that it has arguments. This would also be stored in the uh, coroutine frame, and it has the necessary information to where do I resume next. So this is basically the this, this stack frame plus a little bit of what we can control. Once we have that, the function gets in uh, the return type, which is basically the C over here, which is our coroutine function, by basically calling kind of it has, it, it creates inside the stack frame a, an object of the promise, and on this object it calls get return object. And this should give us our coroutine outer side thingy. Once it has that, it then basically is like it invokes a function which has a try catch block around it. If there's an exception, it goes uh, does unhandled exception. Um, what it does inside is first it basically covates uh, on the promise initial suspend. This is before we actually enter the function, right? Before anything happens, we can suspend and do things. We can set. Uh, whatever uh, uh, things we need to do set up. Then it enters the body, which has at least one of these uh, co-return, co-weight, co-yield operations where it can suspend. It may have many of them. Uh, whatever's in there, it executes that and evades as often as it needs to. 
Eventually, when this thing gets exited, it calls covid on a promise final suspend. So it's basically once the coroutine is done, we are now not doing anything. It does the final suspend. We can stop it and do uh, whatever we need to do as well. If we stop it, we cannot resume it. If we stop it, we need to get rid of it. But this is fine. And so this is basically the actual execution. And because it will typically evade somewhere, you then get the coroutine saying by returning RC. It may have run all the um, the entire coroutine already all to a completion if initial suspend doesn't suspend, the thing internally doesn't really suspend, final suspend doesn't suspend. It may have run to completion. Typically, it will you will have something which suspends. Does that make sense so far? And then what is important for the next part is I'm going to, uh, okay, this is just putting uh, things together. Uh, I'm going to live code. If you have questions, please ask at the point in time because going back is not really a thing, right? So, so let's li do a little bit of coding. I've set up a little bit of kind of, you can imagine you're an interview and we, we get one of these uh, files which has a lot of headers. It does have one class which I... Uh, going to use, which is basically just tracking whether in constructor, copy constructor, move constructor, or destructor was called to show that we uh, uh, construct, deconstruct enough objects. And it will initially show that we have a leak, probably. Okay, so let, let's start coding. And in a moment, it just says hello world. This is not particularly interesting. Um, we want to use uh, coroutine stuff. So the first thing is, and I will go through that in, in some details. Uh, I want to use one of these things. And the compiler messages around that are generally actually uh, fairly good. Because if I go and say, oh, let's compile that, it says, well, covate cannot be used in the main function. OK, so it cannot be used in the main function. Let's get rid of uh, this thing in the main function, put it into function f instead. Let's get rid of the hello world, it's not interesting and make this a normal function. And let's see what, what happens if we, if we do that. Okay, now compiler's still not happy, although we, he said don't hear, okay. Now it tells us that there's a coroutine trait. I'm not gonna talk about the coroutine traits because the easiest way to deal with that is actually, you don't really use coroutine traits, but you use uh, um, uh, a nested type. Over here it complains that void, this void over here, does not have anything set up in the coroutine traits. Okay, fine. I want to create a task. Let's return something different. Let's let's uh, return task, and uh, inside that oops, uh, inside this task, I want to have a promise type, so that the compiler is happy and gets a promise type. And then we don't do that, but we return a task. Okay. Next thing, the compiler goes kind of oh no, member of initial suspend, right? This is the guy where we go. What do we do initially when we when we come in. So there is an, assuming this is standard library is not no support at all, but um, there's basically a few classes. There's, um, uh, not a wait, suspend uh, always and suspend never. Most of the time when entering a coroutine, I find I will end up using uh, suspend always. Over here for now, it doesn't matter too, too much for me. I just want to run into it. So I suspend ever, uh, uh, never which is a really simple class to define, but um, you can look that up. But um, so we do that. So we uh, initial spend, uh, and now the compiler should be, no, it's not happy, should be happy about that one, but now it goes final suspend. Okay, final suspend. Let's do the same thing. We can suspend uh, always, we can suspend never, we can also suspend differently. We will suspend differently, hopefully, in the uh, later. So let's do that. Great. Next, the compiler goes kind of, oh, right. Uh, oh, this guy has to be non-throwing. Fine, right? The idea is, right, there's nothing else we can do, and um, it doesn't want to, to be able to throw. Fine. Uh, sorry, not no. No except. And yes, uh, if you see silly spelling errors or something like that, let me know. OK, next thing it goes, we will skip over that for a moment. That int is not a struct or union type. Uh, instead of it uh, goes and says, oh, get return object. It wants to get a return object. So get return object always needs to return 
at least something convertible. I don't know whether convertible is sufficient, but returning the, uh, the type generally actually works quite well. So let's return uh, our task type. At the moment, it's empty, so we just return empty of that, and then it will complain also that unhandled exception is not there. Fine. Uh, there was recently somebody presenting and said, oh, everybody just does uh, terminate in here. Let's not do terminate. Let's do something more interesting uh, and go inside unhandled exception. It's called when there is a live exception. So we can actually get the uh, current exception. Uh, so let's get that and maybe call uh, that error and we stick into our promise type something where we can hold uh, uh, on to the, the last error. We're not going to use that for now, but uh, if you get to it, if you have something like coroutine returning a value, you probably want to have the value check or, or the function accessing the value first check. Is the exception pointer set? If so, we rethrow that thing and otherwise we return the value. So this is, you can absolutely do reasonable error handling in there. Okay, so I want to covate everything. And now it tells me that uh, over here 17 is not a good thing to, uh, to covate. <sighs> okay, that's disappointing. But basically what uh, covate 17 over here does is, it first goes, well, 17 operator covate returns 17. Uh, there's no uh, evade transform, so it doesn't know what that is. So let's start off with first off uh, making it a little bit ugly, and we go and say uh, maybe create a value evader just to show that you can have an evade something which is just living, uh, uh, which is just a value. If you need that, and, and sometimes it's quite handy to have basically consistent use of things. And for example, when uh, migrating from, oops, uh, uh, when migrating uh, existing code, where you may have a value for now and you may want to make it asynchronous, it may be handy to first uh, be able to evade the thing and migrate slowly. All right, so the value evader, we know over here that we basically want to stick a value in, which is the uh, initialization thing. But this is not sufficient. We also need um, a bool which says uh, evade ready. Now, when we have a value, we know that we are ready. So there's not much, uh, not much for us to do other than saying, right, we are not going to wait on anything. We are there. For whatever strange reason, we do need an uh, evade suspend, which gets a coroutine handle. Let's spell that cunningly short because we're not going to use it. Uh, evade ready always returns true. Evade suspend has never been called. Because why would it be called if you always uh, not suspend? But what we still need to produce is something we need to have an evade resume. This is giving us the opportunity to return a value. So we can, for example, return value over here. Okay. And there's some under squigglies. I don't know why they are, because it nicely compiles. Okay, does it do anything sensible? We don't know. Let's print. So we can uh, covate uh, something. It's just an expression. So we can just uh, print that guy and see if uh, anything interesting pops out as one would expect. Okay, so no, not this one, this, this one. And it prints 17. Now, I talked about... Uh, nearly 20 minutes, well, maybe only 15 minutes, about how to print 17 out of coroutine. <laughs> I don't know, particularly interesting, right? We could have written a function way faster than that. Um, so we probably want to do something slightly uh, more interesting, but this is just showing, yes, we can do that, and this is a very simple uh, setup. Let's make it a little bit more interesting and go and say, well, I want to uh, do something something maybe I.O.-ish, right? And I'm not gonna do actual I.O. because uh, you can watch CppCon uh, last year, my talk, where I implement the I.O. bits of that. Uh, it took me about an hour, so I've sp rather spent the hour this time on, um, uh, on the coroutine bit. So I will pretend I have an async uh, read, and this will have some kind of I.O. context. I need that so that I have something where I can poke things. So I create an IO context and, 
well, maybe we get to uh, to making well. Let, let, let's uh, let's let's keep it really complete, uh, um, really simple. And this is going to be an evader as the guy above as well. So we go and just have another evader. But instead of evade ready going true, we go, well, we have something once we get actual inputs. We actually gonna say false, which basically says something interesting is gonna happen in uh, evade suspend. And to have it actually uh, hold on to something, let's say the read is just returning, call it a line or what, whatever. Since I'm not gonna do IO, um, it's, it's whatever it is. So we basically just return, uh, a string over here. So with that setup, okay, I need an uh, in my somewhere, probably in my uh, in my main. Let's stick it in here. Uh, I/O context. So we get basically our I/O context uh, passed in. Need to pass the correct thingy in though. That goes also over here. And then we can basically pretend that we have I/O over here and basically do uh, some some kind of completion um, once we we dropped out. So let's keep printing that and do um, uh, I call it async read async read which gets our context and this is uh, just to to show a little bit more of what's going on. Let's do this is our first. Uh, output, and then we do second output, and we can do something uh, in between. Now, if I run that right now, it doesn't do, uh, it does compile, maybe. Uh, interesting. Th that's an interesting result, but okay, fine. It, it seems it wants some kind of uh, Constructor of it, or, or constructor, destructor, or something, whatever. I didn't expect that, but we can do that. And I needed to actually add something like that for GCC. Without GCC, it, uh, the initialization of the string wasn't uh, happening correct. Okay, this compiles, but it actually doesn't really do uh, anything interesting. Uh, so far, it only uh, prints uh, the 17, and then it prints first, and then it stops. And the reason it stops, it pump, uh, drops out over here, so we can go over here is, um, let me make it a little bit visible, uh, after, after calling F. So we can see uh, that we actually uh, suspended right after, well, before calling the core of eight, we can see that it uh, jumped out. So now we can basically do something. And now the question is, how do we get it back? And we need to do some things to basically get it back. And one thing we can do is in the await suspend, we could go, well, we actually get uh, something over here, which is an uh, SCD uh, coroutine uh, handle without any parameters uh, does work. So coroutine handle, uh, by default, if you don't pass anything, it uh, has void, which is as kind of a coroutine handle which doesn't know what the promise type is. You can also have a coroutine handle with a promise type which gives you access to the contents of the promise in that coroutine handle as well. Uh, so it's kind of a little bit looking like a base class relationship. You can convert a coroutine handle of something which is non-void to coroutine handle of void. Uh, but we don't know what coroutine is suspending us over here, uh, so we don't do anything with that. And we could go and say, well, our I.O. is the, um, our context uh, object is where we uh, do things and let's keep it really simple and we just stick a handle in there and we, um, uh, we just save that so that we have something to restart. In a real I.O. context, it would be probably one handle per file descriptor or one handle per socket or whatever. Uh, it is, and you basically just uh, have your your things. So this is just a mock-up of an uh, I/O context. And let's also put something in here where we go and we do a complete, and we do a string uh, over here. And I actually realize that I need to put a little bit more. Uh, let's say this is uh, where we do our line, and we go well. Okay, in, in the real world, we would also have a pointer to something. Ah, 
I, I know where I go wrong. I don't want the coroutine handle over here because we really want to have something uh, where we can pass a line. And we could actually, the easiest way to do that is probably to actually bundle um, the the completion, the, the coroutine handle together with the thing and make this a function object. This is actually easier. So every time I, uh, I've presented this a few times, every time I do present it, it's a little bit different. So some of these things are coming, coming uh, always somewhat ad hoc. So if we do that, we basically do completion, we just send something up, and what we do is we do just a lambda which captures our handle, and in our completion, when we get called, we get a string line, and we just go and, uh, well, we, we could go and do it a little bit light, nicer, do a line uh, equals move line, sorry. We don't necessarily copy the guy. <laughs> okay, and then we could go and say in our, after our function, let's go and uh, do context, context complete uh, first so that we don't see the same string and second. Uh, and I hope I didn't mistype too many things. <coughs> I done, sorry? <coughs> ah, ah, good point. Okay, let's fix that. This is silly. This cannot be implicit captured, oh God. No, I don't need the line in context. I need the line in the async read. And handle is not used. Okay, H handle not being used makes sense, right? Once I have completed that, I actually need to do something with the handle. So how do, how do I get, get to continue? I basically go on the handle. I have a few operations. One is um, resume, one is destroy, and you can also ask it things. And I don't know why it underscore things. Probably because I didn't do something else. -ly. Ah, this is an expression, so I need to do that. Okay, cool. So if I compile that, we basically see. All right, we have. Uh, no, this is not the correct output. This one, right? We have first, then after our first, we see uh, we drop out of this function, we complete. And the complete, basically, you can see that it actually prints the first and gets on to second, which is part of the coroutine over here. So we carry it on inside the coroutine with the second part and then print it the second. Does that make some sense? So I hope you over here can see that we nicely did suspend in the middle of coroutine and we can do whatever we want uh, in our coroutine with these things and change things. The outside world doesn't need to know about that. So this is actually kind of nice to carry on. So you don't need, uh, instead of using callbacks, using these continuations in a coroutine, makes it way, uh, way, way nicer. And this is all we needed to do to actually uh, get up a, a fairly simple task uh, to fly. Now, the, the next level of things is, and this is where things get a little bit more complicated, is to say, well, okay, I have a task which does uh, async stuff, this is cool, but how do I deal with uh, actually calling a function, sort of, which is doing async stuff? So we basically want to delegate and package things up into a core team uh, task itself, right? So let's go. I, I'm not going to do necessarily uh, an output, but let's say we want to do uh, a function g, which itself, let's give that also an I.O. context. Um, uh, which is doing uh, some work and then we do uh, F done. And we basically have a task uh, G, okay. Also getting an IO context. For now, we don't do anything over here. Let's do, uh, uh. okay. L let's quickly stick in a core return. If I do a core return, the compiler will actually complain about multiple things right now. Uh, the first one is that uh, it doesn't know how to co-evade G. 
and it also doesn't know what uh, how to do um, uh, how to return nothing from a function. So if you want to, uh, this, is the, this return void. So the promise type I've shown so far is kind of a minimalistic uh, version of a coroutine type. The number of other things we can add or must add depending on what is used in, inside the coroutine. If I want to support uh, co-returning either a void or value, then I need to uh, actually support uh, corresponding operations in the promise type, which basically is for returning nothing. I have to add a return void. Okay, let's add return void. We don't do anything for now. We could imagine we do something, but uh, this is not the actually interesting bit. The more interesting bit is that it goes over here as well and says, uh, well, your task actually doesn't have an uh, await ready, and it's not, it's not a waiter, basically. And what we could do with our task is we could actually turn it into an evader, okay? Which, I'm not going to do though, but at least not directly. So I will actually create instead an, an, um, a class called it nested evader, which is used to basically co evade a task. And uh, we put the, the corresponding, oh, I need to get rid of the context. Um, we, we put the, uh, the various operations uh, in here, evade ready, we're gonna go and say it's false so that we actually do something. And uh, to basically get, if, if I have an argument which doesn't have an, uh, it doesn't have these members, I can get one by basically saying, all right, I have an, uh, an operator co -evade. So this is a new uh, operator. And, uh, now, of course, I'm blanking on what kind of arguments it gets, but, oh, uh, it basically gets an, um, I don't know. It gets some argument. Oh, it, it, um, of course, it, it gets the argument basically of the, uh, of the things we co -evade. We Over here, we want to co a task, and we want to do something with that somehow. So we basically just return uh, an empty version of that. So that, this should get us over the compile time error. Uh, must be unary. Oh, I, I am in the task already, sorry. Okay, so now we have, we can basically co uh, a task, but it doesn't do anything with that. It doesn't even start it in this case because our uh, await ready says false, it just resumes, does not, um, sorry, it, it uh, it says false, so it basically does call uh, evade suspend, but it doesn't do anything with that. What we get is we get a coroutine we need to resume eventually. Okay. When do we resume? Well, the answer to when we resume the outer task is when the inner task is done. The inner task is done, we know that the inner task is done when uh, final suspend on the inner task is called. Everybody with me? A little bit, right? It's kind of getting getting a little bit uh, complicated, right? So, in any case, we basically want to go into our task, um, and basically all the things we store with our task is are pretty much sitting with the with the promise type. So we probably want to have a pr access to promise type either through a handle or through a promise promise type, and. Uh, Storing a promise type is kind of easy enough, so we go and say, this is our, our promise. Now, in our promise type, we can go and say, well, current, so far we stored an error, let's store a little bit more things. Let's also store an, um, a coroutine co uh, handle. Uh, we don't know what that would be, but this would be our final continuation. Continuation. And um, in case we don't get any, there's an, another uh, uh, a coroutine uh, thingy, and this is, there's a coroutine, um, there's a no-op, uh, what's it? Uh, what's it? Uh, uh, blanking, of course, on, on these things. Um, there's, a, there's a trick. Grab no-op in task. Uh, 
Uh, oh, no, no coroutine. Okay. Um, okay, I don't know why, why it unasquickly is that. So this is basically just so that we have always something which we uh, can carry on from if we need it. But if we actually uh, have our um, nested evader, which is, where's my nested evader gone? Nested over here. When we suspend something over here, we go and say, right, we get a handle. This is what we basically need to eventually uh, continue on. And we go, well, the handle, we, we basically just go in our promise type, the final continuation. That should be uh, this handle. So this basically jumps into where, where we want to uh, continue things. And on the, on the uh, promise we have, this is kind of the promise for ourselves, we want to resume ourselves. This is kind of the, we have, uh, the nested evader didn't do anything. Now we, um, uh, now, now we get basically the outer guy gets suspended, the inner guy gets resumed. So we basically want to resume something. At the moment, all I have is, uh, Oh, sorry. At the moment, the only thing is a promise. I need a handle. So how do I get a handle? And the answer to that is, if we have an, uh, a coroutine handle of a promise type, this guy can be created from, uh, from a promise. And then we can resume it. So we just need to pass in uh, a promise object. This should give us from the coroutine handle of promise, if I typed everything correctly, uh, the the thing and cannot use operator on a oh it's, it's colon colon it's not an object it's, it's a global global function that gives us that now the promise uh, problem we have at the moment is I actually don't stick a promise into anything so to get a nested uh, evader with our promise type in our coroutine I basically need to have a promise being passed in in the construction, okay? We currently don't have that. And this is where we can basically go and say our uh, task can actually have a promise type, pointer promise. And now we need to initialize that and the easiest way to do that is in our co-return uh, uh, get return object, we just return that. Okay, now everything compiles and uh, and we can actually go and I think we should be able to see already part of uh, things, but not yet everything. So let's go and put another IO context over here and this is uh, CR. Um, let's do our, our third output is uh, like the other ones, uh, covid async read of context. And then we let's let's complete another one. And I think this should now uh, also be printed. And uh, it isn't. Okay. Now 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 we get to the stage where there's an error. And it's, it's slightly awkward because I don't know what that error is, but we should be able to figure that out. So it clearly gets into the coroutine restores the coroutine and then uh, right we get get the coroutine uh, started the nested coroutine actually uh, didn't start before so this is kind of cool uh, we handle the Okay, this, this is slightly em em embarrassing, of course. <laughs> no, no, I, I don't think so, right? The, the, uh, the, the nested of eight is called on the inner coroutine task, right? And this is the promise of the inner coroutine task. 
So we stick away the handle of the outer carotene handle into the promise of the inner carotene handle. No, nothing yet, but but this should not crash us, right? This is only uh, getting getting things. The the thing which apparently uh, is crashing us is the uh, it must be kind of the completion, right? We get, I think. Let's see whether we get over here, right? Ah, uh, this is the the parts of uh, live coding and especially not doing exactly what I did previously. Right, so we get out of here, we complete, but the completion should be working because we just set the uh, handle in the IO in our, uh, in the async read, right? So, so we jump back into the, oh, I think I have an idea of what, uh, happens for for main I'm uh, for main I'm calling F, right? I think I have an idea what what may be going wrong, and let's do some some tiny tiny twist over here, and then go in final suspend. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Let's let's do uh, first of first of all uh, always, and let's do that always over here as well. Right? Okay, d d this, this guy should be fine for right? initializing that. Ah, big discussions going on. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so n now I have, of course, the problem that it actually doesn't do anything whatsoever, right? Because I actually suspend on all of them. But this is fine, we can just go and let's do do a start over here. I needed to do these things, so it's, it's fine. Okay, how are we looking now? Ah, interestingly, it shows an exception, what? Ah, uh, uh, start promise. Oh, yes, yes, okay. We obviously don't do anything yet. We need to actually also start the thing, sorry. <laughs> oh, and, and actually, you know what it is? It's something really silly. It's on this line, the, the error. Everybody sees on, on this line what the error is? We return a task, right? And the task is a temporary, but we don't do anything with it, right? Let's capture the task. And then we can, because then we can also start it. And then the error should gone, be gone away. Sorry for that, right? Whew. that was a close call. But then you, you see how you can be uh, tricked into thinking that things work while they don't, right? Because we just had executed things. But, but now we can nicely see that uh, it again uh, all, all works. But what does not yet work is um, we, we haven't seen uh, that F is done. Because as uh, somebody pointed out, the continuation coroutine is not yet being used, right? So to use the continuation coroutine, so basically when our task is, uh, our inner task is done, right, we had the, uh, over here, the nested evader, we have stuck away the continuation into the promise, but we haven't actually used uh, this continuation yet. So what we can do is we can go and say, well, actually in the final suspend, if that suspends, then, or, or if that's it's getting called, then we actually resume uh, our continuation. So let's do that. So we basically create another evader, final evader. So evaders are, are plenty, right? We create loads of them. Uh, and uh, I do over there, 
okay, this actually, sh this is not a good copy. I should have copied something which makes all of these guys no except. We had already seen that uh, all of them need to be uh, no except earlier. Uh, so let's make all of them uh, no except first. Then I'm not gonna want this guy to be const and await ready should always be false. So we basically want to have something like uh, suspend always. I could have derived from suspend always and only uh, refined resume, but let's uh, skip it like that. So we basically want to have a final evader uh, returned over here. And the final evader probably needs to have access to this continuation. So we basically give it a promise type as well, or a, a pointer to the promise as well. Okay, and then we return this guy over here. We are inside the promise, we can just return this. And in our suspend, we need to suspend something. So the continuation is always set up to be, continu uh, to be uh, continued, even if uh, we have not suspend anything into that because it's a no-op coroutine we could put suspend. So we can always go and say uh, promise pointer continuation dot resume. And I think with that, we also see the uh, that the the coroutine uh, is done. So we basically have suspended into a task and uh, and and uh, so uh, we we coveted a task as well. Like this is our task we we coveted, and then uh, we we print something and then we are done. Now. The thing which I is at the moment a little bit at odds is, and this is what, why I had this uh, funny uh, tracker object uh, or track object there, is if we add a track object, whatever we call it, let's call it promise over here, just so that we can see something and make it a little bit stand out, you will see that there is actually a little bit of a memory leak. So, uh, just an interesting sequence of, of things, but fine. How, how does the other stuff come out before that comes out even? Uh, but the, the point is we uh, construct a promise uh, or, or the, the coroutine handle, but we do not get rid of it. And we do have a, um, a final suspend where we get rid of things. So what is missing over here is essentially in our task, where we hold, hold on to... Ah, good. Thanks. <laughs> ah, on the evader. I wanted to put it on the SEO. You're absolutely correct. I wanted to put it on the promise. But we see, th this explains the, the, uh, the odd uh, order, but it still shows that we have a memory leak. Um, which is actually interesting, kind of the evader. Uh, okay. Uh, what is happening here? This. Okay, so we okay we see a promise being called over here, promise being called over there, but non non being destroyed. So we still need to get rid somehow of the task, and there's an there's an interesting approach to do that, and that is. Um, we basically want to have a task which, well, we cannot copy them. This would kind of produce two copies that doesn't work. We may make it immovable, but this is slightly annoying because then you cannot put it anywhere. But we can make it uh, nicely movable. And this is roughly speaking exactly the semantics of unique pointer. So if we could have something like an, uh, a unique pointer over here, unique pointer of our promise type, then pretty much everything would work out, except obviously uh, that there's no viable conversion for our return. Uh, oh, there's no viable conversion for get return object to get that into uh, the correct promise type. And we don't really want to have it just a unique pointer and there's also no viable conversion for uh, promise type to uh, uh, over here. So this guy over here is easily fixed. We can just uh, do get. But the other one is a little bit harder to fix. But 
it still uh, all pays off. So instead of this, let's do, say we have an uh, unique handle, uh, which we call, cont and this guy is basically unique handle. And uh, this is a promise type, but this guy would call delete. But on a handle, uh, so, so you basically need to get rid of the handle, but the way to get rid of the handle is not calling delete, it's calling destroy. So we basically, what we want to do over here is in the destructor, we want to, uh, if, or for release, we want to take the promise pointer, turn that into handle and destroy. And we can do that by basically having a little bit of a deleter type, which is basically just a lambda function, which takes uh, our promise type. Let's call that P. And then we basically do, as, as before, you, uh, uh, a coroutine handle, coroutine handle, promise type uh, from promise, promise, we get the promise being passed in. This is this guy. Uh, from promise, and then we do, uh, 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 from promise. And this is our handle, and all we need to do on this guy uh, is destroy. And then the unique handle type is really getting this within uh, with the deleter. And then over here, we don't uh, return this. We do actually return a unique uh, handle of uh, of this. Okay. And if I had typed everything correctly, that should actually work. In line 76. Yes, this, uh, this is actually correct, right? It's kind of a using declaration. This lambda. Say? You, you mean over here I'm using it and then over here I'm defining it? Ah. Ah, lambda expression is not a type. Thanks. Uh, so, so, so the 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 use or define after use. Member functions are actually defined after the closing parenthesis of something and closing. So this is actually fine. But as uh, Matthias pointed out, that uh, lambda function is not a type. We need to get the type of that thing, and then probably something else uh, to return a task. We need to actually also turn it into a task. Yeah, fine. Okay, so so the, this compiles a little bit awkward. The unique handle thing can actually be uh, using Elias, and you can make it actually such that it works with arbitrary uh, promise types, which is kind of also cool. There's a little bit of typing, extra typing to do it. But now we can actually see that we allocate our, um, uh, one promise, we allocate another for the function f, another promise for the function g, and we also nicely destroy them, and all in all, this kind of set things up quite reasonably, and we can see that I can actually evade pretty much anything I, I want. One thing which I haven't shown, but I think I ran out of time, is to say, actually, it would be nice if we could drop the value evader thing from this thing, and we can entirely do that by basically equipping our promise type with an evade transform, which, if it does, isn't an evader, turns it into a value evader. This, however, also requires me to write a concept for evadable things, which can be done, but I'm running out a little bit of time and there's another thing which a real implementation would actually also do, and that is um, the nested type. Probably we want to have kind of a return value from that so that we can co-return things uh, optionally and you would set these things up, but this is basically, and then we could actually do something like an, a covate uh, such that we covate on an actual value which we get back and everything would be kind of much nicer. But uh, so we can also uh, output uh, the result from here. But this is uh, similar things as, as we did before. All right. I think this is what I got time to present. Uh, anybody having any questions? Yes. Ah, he wants to stroll over a microphone. 
So you mentioned the, the, um, the promise type is allocated using new. Is there any way of, like how many, you get like two news in, does every time you call a function that is a coroutine get like a new a new, new? Is there any way of uh, like customizing this news so they happen through an allocator, for example? Yes, you, you can and it's kind of weird and awkward. You can actually have an, uh, a function void point uh, operator new uh, sitting in here, which takes a, a size type as first argument, and then uh, it takes all the arguments you pass into the coroutine function, whatever that is, and you can arrange it to fish out uh, a potential allocator or something from these, this argument list, which then unfortunately also means you need to pass that into the coroutine call. So but you can absolutely uh, do that, and it may be interesting to see what that is over here. If we go and do C out size equals uh, S and print that out, and then maybe we do just uh, return malloc, uh, malloc of uh, S, and then we also need the op opposite side, delete. Uh, no, void pointer, pointer, uh, free of pointer. Uh, I think if everything goes well, out and not allowed in that, what? I don't know why it doesn't like auto over here. Cannot return function type from, oh, operator delete is of course written more like this and same for operator new. <laughs> okay, and if we run that, we should actually see the, the size that allocates for the two uh, stack, stack things and you can see that they're actually different. And, just a few bytes. Thank you very much. And another question. So if you do call await uh, something and you get a temporary in that uh, expression, yes. do you have like issues with that? Because I've heard like... No. But this is the, this part of the amazing coroutine uh, thingy, right? So basically you say over here, call, this guy creates a temporary. This is a temporary which lives in that coroutine stack frame. <laughs> this is part of the reason why these two coroutines uh, have different uh, sizes. So, so they live as long as the coroutine frame lives. Do you get like the, um, um, sorry, for example, you get a, a string view parameter and you pass a, a freshly created a std string, that uh, std string gets uh, extended or do you get like a uh, dangling string? You, you get the same lifetime extension as Arno talked so about uh, safe, right. in, inside the coroutine frame as you would get on a stack frame. Okay, so, thank you very much. So I don't know whether your setup would dangle or not, see Arno's presentation is about that. Okay, thank you very much. More questions? Uh, now, not from a technical perspective, but from a language design perspective. Okay, we see all of this code and it, it looks really complex. I think that for all of us, at least, I, I'm talking for myself, it looks really complex. Didn't you think of delaying this feature till you had some library support, maybe for uh, less experienced users? Because, I mean, doing all of this, it looks like quite complicated. Okay, so there are basically two parts of it. I think the part down here, which is actually using the coroutine stuff, like function f and g, I think they are reasonably easy, right? There's this extra covate thingy, and I think everybody can cope with that. Um, now, you just need somebody to write the task. And if I go back to, to the slides, uh, slides over here on the next slide, there's a link to uh, the, the bottom link is uh, where I will upload the exact code from the presentation, possibly augmented with some of the things I uh, left out. You can basically take a task from there and use it. Uh, you will get a task with C++ in the standard library earliest in 26, so three years away from now. I think this is unhappy. I think it's happier to have the tools already around and have 
maybe a boost task, uh, maybe this task, or uh, Lewis Baker's, I uh, link to his uh, coroutine resources, which are good instructions, and it's pretty much where I learned all about coroutines. He also has the library, libcoro, where you get a bunch of coroutine implementations. So you don't have to write the complex code, but you can actually already use it. I think that is a reasonable choice, and it's also a priori not even clear without the coroutine feature what needs to go into the library because nobody has experience about that. So it's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem, and we decided to lay an egg without having a chicken, or other way around, depending on how you want to view it. Um, just a quick question. Does it allow, I mean, the coroutine, does it allow multi-threading? Okay, coroutines per se don't require multi-threading, but you can absolutely suspend one coroutine in one thread and resume it in a different thread. So they are orthogonal in a sense. So does it support uh, multi-threading? Seems to be kind of a uh, category error question, right? Yes, yes, you can absolutely use them in the context of, uh, uh, of multiple threads, but how you interact with threads uh, is pretty much up to you. More questions? Okay, everything okay. is now clear about coroutines. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right, thanks.